Well, I want to thank you all for joining me today live from my drum room. And uh, I want to welcome my guest, who's a very dear and old friend, the great Eddie Taduri. <laughs> there you are. Hey, man. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. You too, man. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank you for having I, me. My pleasure, man. It's it's a Eddie. It's a it's a pleasure. It's an honor, and and uh, thank you for saying all those nice things earlier. And uh, by the way, you can start now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everybody watching. If you don't know, Eddie is the famous who who watches all these shows, and uh, oftentimes he's, you know, running a little late, and he'll say to me, "You can start now." So I appreciate that. Uh, it's great to see you welcome home i know you're in nashville how long were you in nashville for just seven days like monday through monday yeah uh, it's i love it there I, I lived there for a little while it wasn't my cup of tea in that respect i'm, I'm a yankee after all yeah and, but i love the people there yeah i uh, i worked there originally with doby gray back in the early 70s oh man and Definitely. i met danny flowers and chris lucinger who are two of my my most favorite people that they're, they're just amazing and uh we're still friends we, we were in that band together all the way back i think it was 72 and three maybe wow and we're still very close we keep in touch Chris plays on every, he's a, a, a studio player, but he works with Garth Brooks. Yeah, uh, I know the name for sure, yeah. And Danny Flowers wrote Tulsa Time, and uh, 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 I was a burden, a whole lot of uh, gospel -y, like, in fact, we went to his church on Sunday where he and his wife, Mabel, plays B3 and pedals. And a drummer, oh my God, Kyra, she was so funky. I was like dumbfounded the whole time. And and of course, Danny. And I had Sean Murphy, great, one of the, my favorite singers in, in the world, and uh, and Chris and his wife. So I, every day was a was a a, a real uh I, I, I would I wasn't surprised, but I was surrounded by such love and and friends from years you know what it's like when you get with you, you've been friends with somebody for 40 or 50 years yeah yeah so it, it was wonderful um, that's great you know so that and everybody else i mean the pearl company of course pearl is my partner in in, uh, in the trap program they do so much for me i i don't even know where to begin you know, marketing and uh, uh, shipping, receiving, uh, export, import, about everything. That's great. Every, whenever I need anything, I make a phone call and it's there. And so, and great, great company, great people. Mm -hmm. Know a lot of the folks there. Yeah, excellent. And you've, you've been with Pearl like a long time, right? I mean, you've yeah, been... 30 years, something like 30 years or so. Yeah, right? yeah. They've been... I, well, I was with them as an endorsee. And then... <clears throat> And then when I got hurt, I tried uh, getting a couple of other companies involved because I needed, even though it's not a drum program, we needed the drum for the tactile component of the learning curve. I'll, I'll explain a little more later. But sure, yeah. I the other companies were well. How many drums can you sell? I said, well, maybe none. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it, this is a charity. Uh, I'm not looking at it in that respect, you know. When I saw a couple of people fell out, and when I approached Pearl at a NAMM show, I said, I, 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 I need help. I can. They said, why didn't you come to us? What do you want? They flew me there. We made all these, and the arrangement has not changed one iota, except it's getting better and better and better. That's great, you know? man. I mean, <clears throat> Raymond Massey, have you seen Raymond? I'm sure you've seen Raymond play. Yeah, I saw him. I saw him play with um, Tanya Tucker. In fact, I'll just I'll just oh, say wow. I saw wow. Raymond at PASIC back in November last month, and oh, I yeah. hadn't seen him in a while. And maybe he's even watching today. I hadn't seen him and gave oh. each other a big hug. I signed him as an endorser back in the in the nineties. Okay. And, yeah, and then he he invited. And I said to him, we were talking about this too. It's funny you say that, Eddie. I said. Am I am I remembering correctly, Raymond? That 
I knew he was a great player. And I said, you came through town with Tanya Tucker? Were you? And he said, yeah, man. You know, he's like the most laid back, you know, yeah, man, that's right. You remember that? Yeah, I, I remember, you know. Anyway, he's a monster drummer. Monster I mean, drummer. And, um, where else does Dennis Chambers go for drum lessons? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, God, Dennis comes in there, sit down with him and play that. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, and, and he said, he said, I asked him about that. I was teasing him the other day and he said yeah he said he calls me from all over the world <laughs> they're yeah. really they're connected you know that's great wow yeah and then glenn caruba is on the road with uh, rodney crowell now but that's the thing about pearl they let you go yeah. go out in the world be who the person you are and and at, at, while you're committed to us at the same time but they don't they don't uh uh stifle anyone from their careers or their their they're playing. I mean, Raymond can go do anything. Yeah, he plays. I, I remember he was playing three, four nights a week and then going to work. Yeah. You can do that when you're younger. Exactly. Yeah. You can. <laughs> That's a young now, man's I game. I kids from four in the afternoon till seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, oh, man. Well, Dave, Dave Grillo, Grillo, thank you for saying that. Um, uh, uh, one of our longtime uh, viewers is saying he loves the podcast. Keep him coming. Merry Christmas and rest in peace, Dino Donelli, um, which you probably heard about Dino or maybe you oh. hadn't. Yeah, Dino passed away. It was announced yesterday. So, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. He was the biggest influence. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, back in the day, that's where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> and there were a lot of bands around in those days, but nobody played like the rascals i mean we had the vagrants with leslie west and mountain and they turn in and yeah. the pigeons who were the vanilla fudge and we, we had great new york bands just unbelievable guys great players but nobody played like dino he was no. i used to watch him and go that's on i don't i'll never get there you know i was very but young no, but I agree. I mean, I, I, I came up, I started playing. I was aware of the Rascals in the 60s. I was born in 60, so I'd, you know, I'd see them on the Ed Sullivan show. And then when I started playing in the early 70s, their music was still as fresh as ever. And, uh, and, I, and I always looked at him, Eddie, like he was the American Ringo and that he, he had the same effect, you know, that, that Ringo had on, on so many drummers Maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean just yeah, did, uh, and Ringo, there's nobody like Ringo, and then there really wasn't anybody like him. So, in that respect, yeah. they really were icons. Um, and, I don't yeah. know if anybody turned more drummers on than Ringo. Did. No, I don't think so. I, I agree, I don't think anybody did, but but you know, Dino, you like you said, born in the 60s, I was born in 1960, yeah, 60. Well, yeah. I have socks older than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see i knew it was going to be this i knew it would be mostly this we, 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 <laughs> oh my god but what, but man, what is, i mean the best drummers are comedians i mean walfredo reyes jr yeah yeah he picked it up on stage I, I love his playing i mean i just love it but if he never played a note he could make me laugh for a half an hour and that and Vinny. Oh my he's gosh! A good, I mean, you put him on stage, and he's just—he takes off. He's pretty yeah. good. He's you know, he's all these stand-up comedians. Forget about the drums. There, there are a lot of. You're right. I mean, Stan Lynch is one of the funniest guys I know. Uh, I mean, Stan is just—he'll just, just kind of like Vinny. He'll just do like a monologue. He'll just go off and uh, right, right. hilarious. You know, right. um, I I spoke with Gad yesterday and it was five straight minutes of jokes of him oh. one after another, just one after another. And my wife's standing there. We, we actually, Kelly, we had to go out and she, she's just like shaking her head. Cause I'm on the phone, holding my phone, just going, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you know, uh, anyway. Oh, uh, but, um, but yeah, rest easy. That's Dino. The, thing, the camaraderie, yeah. the camaraderie and respect we have for each other beyond the drum set. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I, I respect so many players for the people they are. 
Yeah. When, when you yeah. look at their playing, I mean, all, all the fellas that we know and the girls, you know, I just heard a fat, I told you, a fat back drummer at, at church the other day. She she knocked me out. We're friends on Facebook now. I'm sending her stuff. She's incredible. Great. But uh, the point is, you know, most of these guys and gals are just, they're wonderful people. Yeah, they're incredible yeah. people. If they never played a note, they I'd still want to be their best friend. You yeah, know? that's uh, that's beautiful. Yep, <laughs> I I know exactly what you mean. And 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 you're known in the in the industry and in the in the drum community as being that kind of guy too. That that you know you're you're a friend to everybody. You know and and. I, w I want to get into trap in a little bit. We'll talk about that and, and how that came to be. But sure. I do, I just want to, you know, I want everybody watching too, to, to know, you know, about your incredible career as a drummer too, you know, and. Yeah, I never talk, uh, since I got hurt, I never talk about that. I, but I, 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 uh, I've worked a lot. I know. Yeah. You know, over the years, we all have to. I mean, there was a guy at the airport the other day and asked me, well, what kind, what kind of music do you play? And I said, man, I made a living playing drums my whole life. I said, so, I mean, I would play polkas if I had to, uh, to pay the rent. And, yeah. and with all my heart and soul, I would play a polka, you know, because you can't really, if you, if you, not everybody is Steve or Vinny or, you know, those cats who, yeah don't have to be on the phone every five minutes for a gig and don't have to play polkas all the don't time have to play polkas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they've played a couple, but uh, so yeah, it, it's a, uh, it's a matter of, of, of being open and playing uh, anything you're asked to play. It was, it was difficult for me coming from where I'm from. I know three beats. I, I I've known three beats my whole life. And I paid the rent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, that means a lot. I mean, yeah. that really, that's saying a mouthful. If you're a musician, you can, that, people say, who'd you play with? I said, I paid the rent for my whole life. Yeah. And, and you know what? And I was just going to say, I think what you said is so important too, that, I mean, I know you're, you're being a little humble by saying you only play three beats, but, but the point of it is the simplicity of just, being a solid drummer. I know that's what you were known for. That's why you got hired to play with Dwight Yoakam and the Beach Boys and, and Dobie Gray. And, you know, you don't get those calls if you're, if you can't lay it down and just make it feel great, make the guys in the band feel great, be a great guy to hang out with on the bus, you know, all those elements of, of what it takes to be successful. Yeah, I, I agree. I know a lot of guys, uh, who have made um, Jack Bruno? I yeah, mean, Jack, we were talking to uh, Jack the other day. Look, look at all those years. And yeah, how do you stay in the same band all those years? Not just because you're a great player, right? Right. <clears throat> I mean, he can't make meatballs, but <laughs> <laughs> but but he knows you. Yeah, as other so... <laughs> Oh man, yeah, no. He... <laughs> no, you're right though. Jack is like one of those guys that's that's just such a a, a great human. I mean, what a phenomenal player. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and he said that the other day too. That he's again another humble guy, obviously. And he was saying that Tina really liked him and and was comfortable with him. But I got to think, besides you know, the, the whole package of, of who he was as a person had something to do with that as well. You know, that, that he was just a, um, the kind of guy you want to have on the, on the bus or in Tina's case, dependable. the plane. Well, I would imagine he's probably the most dependable guy on the road. Yeah. I would imagine. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, I mean, when, when you first said you were going to have him on us, the only, the only word that really identifies uh, is perfect. He plays perfectly. Yeah. He doesn't overplay. He plays the pocket. When he embellishes, it's real. It's just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I always feel like I'm tripping over my feet when I play a fill out, out of context or something. Jack was one of those guys. He was just. I never heard him. 
you know, I've, I've worked with Chris Pinnock, a guitar player, for 50 mm. years. Yeah. Chris is amazing. And he's never played a bad note. I don't know how that's possible. He plays really fast. And, and, and uh, he's a very intelligent player. He never hits a bad note. It really pisses me off. You know, I hate those guys. guys like Damn. Yeah. Vinny's, uh, Vinny's like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, no anyway. surprise, Eddie. We, we we have a lot of our friends watching today, and uh, okay. a couple of really great comments, which you can see later. But um, uh, I was thinking three or four people would show up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Jake Jacobs says, "Great to see t the two of you hanging, Eddie. Your oh. polka was questionable. <laughs> Love you, Pat." <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> Oh, that's too funny. And Bill Donnelly yeah. says, Eddie is all love and no bullshit. Amen. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll second that. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. yeah. So so my recollection of us meeting was... I'm sorry, I led you away from the playing thing. No, no, that's okay. No, I was just going to say when I met you, um, I think you were playing with Dwight Yoakam. It was in the, in the 80s. Yeah. I was living in LA. We were introduced uh, by Tim Smith, our Tim mutual Smith. friend. Yeah, and yeah. you were doing rim shot drumsticks. You had just started, you know, running the operation in the states. That and, was uh, that was a departure, but it was I I really enjoyed my years with the various companies. Yeah, yeah, it was a whole new ball game. You knew very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Dwight, was... uh, I had been in Canada for four years. I, I traveled around, lived in Europe, lived in other cities and states. And I was in Canada where I, I honestly think some of the best musicians in the world are just on every corner, it seems. Everywhere I went, I saw guys that were just stupendous. Mm -hmm. I, on every instrument, vocalist, everybody. And I was there... Uh, Playing with a band called the Lincolns, Danny Weiss on guitar, Michael Fonfera on keyboards. There was a guy named Prakash, and uh, Steve Ambrose uh, was the lead singer, and uh, Earl Seymour was on sax. So those guys don't ring a bell because here in the states or elsewhere, nobody knows who they are. But there, like there was a band called the Downchild Blues Band. Mm -hmm. They've been around for fifty years. They are the uh, the inspiration for the Blues Brothers. In fact, Ackroyd still sits in with them. No kidding. And, okay. Uh, yeah, the the first uh, Blues Brothers album, you'll see Donnie Walsh wrote two of the songs on that first album. Yeah. Okay. I remember he got a check and bought a yacht. So I, I, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Really well. <laughs> anyway, I, I had left town for four years, and when I came back, I went to Josephina's, you know, which was the best hang in town. That was a great spot, man. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, Dwight came walking out as I was walking in. And we had played together, uh, not a lot, but uh, enough uh, back, you know, five or six years prior. And we worked in little honky tonks. He'd come by and pick me up in his Chevy and, and you know, we'd play for 25 or $40 and play mostly kind of bluegrass with drums he's so talented yeah yeah so his music is um it's exemplary in that field and and pete anderson and the drummer took him to a whole other place uh an entirely different place they took the 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 bluegrass stuff and made rockabilly out of it and they became famous you know he yeah. said you won't believe what happened to me I, I've been on Johnny Carson. I sold a million records. I, I hugged him. I said, that's, wow. You know? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and maybe six months later or sometime later, after Rimshot was up and running, I get a call from him. And he said, would you come on uh, and do a tour? I said, sure. I, you know, if I can invite some uh, players and, and stores and people, some merchant people, it'd be great. You know, I'll take some promo with me we're going to be in 52 cities on your dime yeah i take advantage of that he said yeah sure Eddie. you know and so that's how that came together you know uh i i'm the first to admit i don't really i'm not a country drummer uh people 
and I took a lot of country gigs. I mean, there mm-hmm. was from Charlie Rich and Freddie Fender to Rick Nelson and the Stone Canyon Band to, to Dwight. All of them were country live and did a show in Vegas called Country Fever. But people hire me because I swing everything. I, I, James Gatson is like one of my idols, right? Oh, so everything man. I play sort of came between him and Bernard, maybe, you know. Yeah. And, and so these country guys would say, man, I love the way you play that, you know, and because I couldn't play the simple boom chick, uh, 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 which is an art, a real art yeah. form. I tried to learn it, you know, but, yeah. but uh, so I would play, get these jobs, a lot of jobs. I don't know why, because I sucked at country. <laughs> After a month or so, people would say, uh, Eddie, can you kind of play that song more like the record? And I said, no. But with all due respect, I'm not, you know, that's not, I can't do that. I told you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you liked me because it felt different, but then country fans, you know, you don't play the fill where it belongs in the right place and you don't, it doesn't feel right to them. They'll, they'll let you know. And they were, you know, like, yeah. what's, I do that? what's that? What's that? That back shit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You can't do that in country. <laughs> so, I would leave and then to, and then somebody else. I, I had to work. We all had to work. I never said no. So I did a lot of, uh, Freddie Fender was incredible. I loved him. I knew him from back when I was with Rick Nelson. Real fun guy. He he rocked. I mean, yeah, he really yeah. rocked as a person and as a performer. I was probably one of my most memorable fun gigs. And it was short lived. I don't know, a few months. You know? Anyway. But man, what a, you know, and I want to ask this question before it. Uh, Brian Wilson is asking, not that Brian Wilson, another Brian Wilson, yeah. right. uh, was asking, uh, was J.D. Foster in Dwight's band then? No. No. Okay. Thanks, no. Eddie. And thanks for the question, Brian. And I yeah, know there's some others. I'll, I'll, tr- I'll try to get to these other questions. But, um, and I also remember, too, I, I'm thinking about this while we're talking, Eddie. One of our, both of our uh, dearest friends, Marty Farah. Uh, oh, yeah. Marty, I, Marty and I worked together. I met him when I moved to LA in 85 working at uh-huh. Simmons and Marty used to talk about you. So I, I, you know, I knew who you were. I certainly knew who you were when I met you in around 87 or 88. And, uh, and, and I remember you being at that time, you know, you were like one of the guys on the scene and, and, you know, Vinny used to, I, was lucky. Vinny, I had a lot of kids. Yeah. yeah. You know, I worked all the time. Vinny used to refer to you as my friend, Eddie Taduri. Yeah. Say, I was talking to my friend, Eddie Taduri, and he was telling me he, he sometimes gets the same pain in his shoulder that I get, you know, or whatever. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're I, point to all that is you, you know, you've always been beloved by all these, all these guys. So. Both of those guys, uh, Vinny and Marty, Marty on a, uh, even, well, not on a larger scale. Marty played with me. Well, I had an organization called Musicians for UNICEF. Right. And we did seven years benefits uh, twice a year, but over 300 musicians participated in LA. It was great. It was a great thing. I, I can't even begin to tell you who played from every, everybody played. Everybody I knew played in that at yeah. one time or another. Marty played double drummers with me every show. And then we had a band called Thunder Up where we but we had two drummers, Jerry Watts on bass, Sean Murphy sang, and uh, oh God, Danny Grenier. Yeah. It was always two drummers with Marty and I. And Marty, we were different drummers, but the pocket was perfect. Yeah. Ricky Fatar, when I when I took the job with the Beach Boys, was Carl asked me prior to my taking that job, uh Actually, I was working in the studio with him, and he wanted me to go to Holland with him. And uh, they were they were doing uh, that record, and uh, where Sail on Sailor was uh, released, yeah. the Holland record. And I couldn't. I was on the road with Rick or somebody at the time. I couldn't do it. Later on, uh, I was able to do it, and they kept asking me, and so I did it. But I, I didn't really know how to play that uh, kind of. A, a surf music. It had that surf vibe, right? Yeah. 
Sure, yeah. And, uh, like I said, that wasn't one of the three beats I knew. So <laughs> I actually, I got there. Ricky Fatar was playing drums. I said, why do you want, you know, and they said, well, Ricky plays all these other instruments and we would like you to play and then he can get out and play steel and guitar and bass. So he did everything, Ricky yeah. Fatar. Yeah, great so drummer, yeah. I called him up because I was nervous about getting, uh, you know, cutting it. And uh, they had already hired me. So, I, you know, oh, my God. I, I showed up at rehearsal, and Ricky was set up. I said, Rick, would you mind, like, playing along with me? I could copy you. I said, I'm, I admit, I, it's not my cup of tea. I would really, it would be really helpful. He said, of course. He's such, he's such a great guy. Yeah. So he set up, and we started playing those all those songs. And I just copied him. I copied him, tried to stay in the where he was, played the same, everything. And it sounded great. Okay. But I had, I had been playing with two drummers for a long time. Dennis Kenmore was the first guy in a band called Pollution with uh, Tata Vega and, uh, and Doby Gray. Anyway, so I'm following Ricky, and it sounded good. And Carl was like, and the band liked it. So I actually talked. Ricky said, yeah, I said, let's do this for the show, two guys. And Ricky said, sure, you know. And then we went to Carl with it and said, you know, it sounds so good. Why don't we use two drummers on the tours? And he said, okay, let's try. And so we did. So once again, the, I, I sucked at that music, but Ricky, <laughs> because of Ricky, <laughs> no, I got it. And it was really great. And we had, you know. And people were going, wow, man, uh, some New York uh, journalist wrote, oh, yeah, this guy, Eddie, thought of this two-drummer thing. <laughs> <laughs> James Brown thought about that. <laughs> yeah. I'll yeah. Bet, uh, but I'll bet with you, Ricky, it sounded, it probably sounded unbelievable. It was great. We both play, yeah. you know? And we changed some of the stuff a little bit. Help me, Rhonda. We'd start just drums. And we, and I played this funk and don't boom 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 instead yeah. of boom boom boom. Right? Yeah. And then Ricky played that, and so in the big stadiums where you could just hear the drums. Oh my God. Yeah, I bet it was. Awesome. It was just powerful, and so that was fun. That was really fun. They were really nice people, all of them. I just I had a great time. You know. What an honor to 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 play in that band, you know, to to be, yeah, I, I, part of I, that I, legacy, I, you know. I mean, even to this day, I was uh, uh, I work in Ecuador a lot now with Trap. For twelve years, I've been working there. I love it. I consider most of the people their family. Uh, I just, I, it's it's so powerful for me. One time, we were getting off the plane and going. We went through customs and we're walking up the aisle to leave the airport. And there's all these cameras and lights and big, and you know, and, and we're all looking around. Who's this? Who that? There must be a celebrity on the plane. And and it was me. <laughs> not, uh, not for nothing, but <laughs> rap program was it does very well there. Not like it, it way better than it does here. They get that it's pedagogical and not a drum circle, right? So. Uh, and all quality cool teachers. So I, I said, what, me, what do you want with me? And they said, well, you're, you're a beach boy. I said, oh, that's so great. Okay. <laughs> this is their equivalent of 60 Minutes. It's a big show. And yeah. I had a, a, a big segment and, they, you know, the interviews. I tried to play it down a little bit, but they weren't having it. You know. That's, so. that's it's something you would do, but that's... That's so cool. I, you know, I'm proud of that, that I had done that. But it's one of those things that's a sideman gig. Yeah. You do it for, I think I did three or four tours, short ones, maybe four or five, six months. And I remember a friend of mine who loved the Beach Boys that I grew up with. Somehow, after I left the band, the next time they were touring, whenever that was, my friend got backstage and he, he, he approached Al Jardine and he said, Al, I know Eddie Tadori. I just finished this. Tour. And Al Jardine went, I'm sorry, Eddie, who? 
<laughs> so there you have it. Yeah, but I'm sure he knew you as Eddie the drummer. Maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, but <laughs> that's but you're you're, I mean, you're that real. Happens. Yeah, that but, happens. I mean, you know, we work for people we think we're best friends. I worked with Jimmy Messina for a long time. Jimmy and I really hit it off uh, because we were the, exactly the same age and uh, have been through all this stuff and history together, but not together, but in the same place, but we never really played together. Yeah. And I, did, uh, I heard, he called me up, Mike, Mike Clark had the gig. And uh, it, at the last minute he had to leave. So he called me up, he said, listen, I told Messina, he doesn't have to audition. You could just walk it. You'll do the gig. So he doesn't have to go through all the shit. He felt bad about bailing at the last minute. Yeah. So I showed up. I got the gig. Long story short, I got the gig. And uh, so uh, Jimmy and I, probably for, probably a year and a half or so, and uh, I know Jack didn't talk about uh, working with. I I told Jimmy about Jack. Actually. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, but uh, we did a record uh, there together, and uh, and Jimmy is the one that talked me into moving back to California. Wow. Yeah. But uh, that was a gig that you know there were there were some gigs that I was really happy with that I really felt great about, and that was one of them. Jimmy's a great guitar player producer engineer arranger all of all of the above yeah you can be a little uh cranky once in a while so so can i <laughs> you know yeah me too, but, uh, me too. Well, the, the, the point is after i played with him all that time when i broke my neck he showed up at the hospital one day and then i, I didn't see him or hear from him for 20 years wow and then he calls me up like last year. He calls up, hey Eddie, man, uh, you remember that drum set you gave me? I need a part for it. And I, I wondered, you know what? Like nothing, no time transpired. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 I was completely fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. He was okay. And what I'm saying is you work with people and then you don't see them and they're on to them. I, I haven't talked to Mike McDonald, but we worked together for five years. He Doing benefits. Mike's great, and he lives up the street. Mm. He he and his family have had a lot of Tadori meatballs. Trust me. <laughs> <clears throat> After a while, that's my calling card. You know, when Vinny, Vinny play, I live across the street from the bowl. When Sting played there, yeah, I couldn't get a ticket. Right? They couldn't. They couldn't give me a ticket. But I, so I go. I usually when friends are there, I, I walk across the street. It's right. There. So I made. The, a giant pot of sauce and meatballs. And I took this all up. I drove up the hill. And, <laughs> you know, we all ate like pigs. Stayed, the whole band, all everybody, the band, the vocalists, the crew, everybody had meatballs. <laughs> and, we, and, and, then, uh, and then I took my pots and pans and I went home. I didn't even see the show. <laughs> I heard this story. I think Vinny told me this story, actually. Like yeah. Oh, my God. That's so <laughs> you. That is so you. Oh, my God. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's it. So you work for people, and then you don't see them. And, or if you run into them, it's, you know, uh, it's that side man persona that uh, it's, we, go, we move from job to job to job. And and sometimes we don't maintain any sort of uh, relationship with the with the boss yeah. or the even well the band usually. I still talk to guys I played with in various bands. Obviously, Rick Nelson's band, uh, Jay White and and Dennis uh, Sorokin. We've been friends all these years. That was from 1974 and five. Wow. Kept in touch. We did a, a Stone great. Band reunion in Chicago about five years ago. Just the three of us. It was fantastic. So, yeah, but the, the stars, not so much. Mike, I mean, after all this, I haven't talked to Mike in two years. Wow. I talk to his wife all the time. They live up the street. 
Yeah, so, yeah. You know, the pandemic well, and all that. And he he's had a busy, rough, roughly or year or so um, with the Doobies, you know, being back with the Doobie Brothers. So he's been, cut him a little slack, Eddie. He's been busy. COVID twice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that too. Yep. Yep. Listen, Mike McDonald is the nicest, accom most accommodating. Was when I got hurt, he was here. Mm. Whenever I needed anything, he was on the phone. He's not. <clears throat> the last show we did together, we were all in the living room. I was all bandaged up from the cancer operation. And they came over to make fun of me, I think, you know. And Amy had just broke her her, her leg or her, or her ankle. And she had uh, she was sitting next to me. And we're talking. And Mike, every time he would complain, do I have to be, you know, I have to be in front? Can't I just be the piano player? I, I sing a couple of songs. I just want to be in the band. I said, no. No, you can't just be the piano player. Are you kidding? No, you're Michael McDonald. Yeah, yeah you can. I'm sorry, pal, but you know we, we won't sell any tickets. <laughs> so he says, "Well, uh, you know," and he's serious. So Amy and I, I, I had just gotten out of the hospital. And I had this wristband on that said "Fall Risk," and Amy had just been on. She had the same armband on, and her arms were on the couch. She like this. And just when that happened, I looked at those two wristbands. I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Mike. We're going to say, Michael McDonald featuring the band Fall Risk. <laughs> Everybody cracked up, but I did all the promotion like that. And I, you can imagine all the, I have all my friends are therapists and nurses. Yeah. <laughs> so I asked uh, Jan Ingram, my dear friend, she and her husband live down the street. They're the sweetest people in the world. I oh, said, man. can you get me some wristbands? She said, how many? I said, you know, a couple of hundred. <laughs> so she showed up a few days later with a couple of hundred wristbands. And everybody at the show got them. All the band warm and, you know. Oh, that's great. So, I get a, I get one I, one Mike McDonald story, if you'll permit me. Um, I, was in, I was coming home from Nashville. I'd been down in Nashville for a bit. This was... I was still working for Zildjian, so maybe 10 years ago. And uh, I'm in the Admiral's Lounge at the airport, Nashville uh, airport. And I see Michael McDonald come in. And I happen to be on the phone with Harry McCarthy. And uh -huh. I'd, I'd, seen, I'd seen Harry the night before. We'd had dinner. So, you know, Harry's like saying, have a great trip, you know, whatever. And, and, and I'm on the phone with Harry. I go, Harry, Michael McDonald just walked in. And he's he, Michael McDonald, like looks my way and smiles at me, gives me this big yeah. smile because he knew I knew who he was. And he's kind of like he looked really approachable. And I said, you know, and, and Harry says, oh, tell him I said hi. And I went, yeah, OK, sure. Yeah. And he said, no, seriously, hi. seriously, I know him. Tell him I said hi. So I hold my phone. I go, Harry McCarthy says hi. And he goes, oh, you know, Harry. And he comes over and we, <laughs> it was like he was the nicest yes, yes, guy. No pretension. Yeah. Nicest None. guy. I mean, yeah. I, you know, um, and I write about that in the book too. With all the, uh, I wrote about all those people in the resume, everybody, because uh, I don't usually talk about that. I took notes all those years. When I got to Michael McDonald. It was a different story, different than anybody. He's just so kind. He's the kind of guy you would like to be friends with. Yeah, he seems it. If he was a plumber you would still want to be his best friend. He's just so kind. Yeah, yeah. He helps everybody. He doesn't say no. That's a problem. He doesn't, he doesn't say no uh, to uh, here in town. Uh, you know, he'll do concerts every week for free for what, oh. one concern yeah. or another. I don't know how he does it. And then he'll fly in from, you know, another country, just show up in time for the gig and boom, you know, I mean, he's an amazing guy. And his wife, Amy, sweeter than him, even. She's wow. the best. And I knew her from Josephina's. You know, that was that, a great spot, Josephina's, man. I... Yeah, Lothar and Bob and all those, uh, Chris, they're still with us. We're, st we're still all playing together. You know, Amy, uh, I'm in touch with Amy more than Mike, even. Mike's, he's pretty busy. Well, Eddie, can you, can you, um, 
you know, I talk about uh, trap and I, and I, you know, maybe. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay. And I, and I, I, I feel funny even asking you to, to talk about the circumstances that led to. Oh, no, starting I don't, that, but I thank God for my broken neck. Well, I do. I, you're a stronger I'm, man than me. Well, I, I'll tell you uh, briefly. Uh, I was, I'm a body surfer and I'm, I was very physical before I broke my neck. I was in Taekwondo five days a week. And I, I, I'm not saying I was any good at it, but I was very active in it and very uh, in, in, in shape. And uh, and surfing every day, body surfing. Yeah, I hit a bad wave. The wave <clears throat> was during El, El Nino time, and the waves uh, and the current was uh, especially tough. And I jumped in a wave and it just went bam! It pounded me into the bottom, and I heard a big snap, and then nothing. And I was all alone. I was twenty yards out by myself, totally paralyzed, three feet underwater, all alone. And I saw a beautiful energy. It's very difficult to explain. I've heard other people try to explain their near-death experiences. This wasn't like a light at the end of the tunnel, but it was a, a tremendous energy and a, 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 a completely enticing, loving, beautiful. It was like being in God's hot tub. It was just wonderful. Uh, I knew that my body was floating this way and my spirit the other way. And I knew I had to discard my body to go on, to continue on this journey. There's no way I wanted to come back. And so uh, I said, well, I'll have to open my mouth, let the water in, and I'll discard the body, and then I can get on my way. And uh, so I opened my mouth wide to let the water in, and I was lifted from the bottom and got a mouthful of air. And then I was placed gently at the shore where the lifeguard with the most seniority on the Central Coast came by. And he said, are you all right? I said, no, I'm actually, I'm totally paralyzed. And jovial about it because of what I've just experienced. So he put surfboards up around me so the waves wouldn't uh, drown me. And then he, and the, the, the lifeguard uh, that was the lifeguard. Then the paramedic with the most seniority showed up. They put me on, and that's that's where quadriplegics have the. That's where the worst harm can come to them when they're being transported. This guy was really very good. He put me and put me into the ambulance and took me to the hospital, where they rolled me into the number one sur neurosurgeon on the Central Coast. Happened to be there on a Saturday. Uh, Dr. Scott Connolly, and he said, I'll take this guy. So they he took me in, they did an MRI, and he showed me what was happening. Uh, my sixth vertebra was totally herniated and pushing against the spinal cord. So he said, this is what happened. This is how it looks. I said, he says, and your spinal cord is bruised. I said, great. So a couple of weeks, it'll be fine, right? And he said, uh, no, not your spinal cord doesn't heal from that. I said, so what do you need to do? He said, well, I have to put your neck back together and fuse it, and all that. And I said, so when are we going to do that? Like in a couple of weeks, when are you going to do that? I remember this. And he said, no, Eddie, you have to do it right now. I was joking and, and laughing. And I, I had such a great experience underwater that day that nothing bothered me. Wow. Nothing at all. So I, he did the operation six and a half hours later. I wake up in the ICU and I wake up and I'm just a head, right? Nothing else. I can't, nothing. And I saw angels everywhere. And then there were nurses and there were kind of angels following them around. It was just like, just what I saw. Yeah. And it's, that's the way it was. No one can tell me different. Yeah. Right? And uh, so then I went, I better take inventory. And I, so, well, I can talk, I can wiggle my ears, I can blink my eyes. So that's, I can work with that, you know. I was already thinking about how, how can I be purposeful if I'm just a head? So, and laughing. So this doctor comes in who happens to be my surgeon's partner. His name's Jones. 
and he's one of the best surgeons in the world, but he's he's got a very bad bedside manner. Everybody knows it. I didn't. He came and he said, Oh, I'm Dr. Jones. I'm your I'm your surgeon's partner. And he said, How are you doing? He said, I'm fine. I said, I'll be walking out of here in a couple of weeks. And he says, Who told you you'd walk again? And I looked up at him and, and I can't say that I actually said that, but I, I, I at least mouthed it, fuck you. You know, and he said, well, uh, you know, I said, never, but just fuck off. Yeah. And he walked away. Next time I saw him, I walked in his office. Oh, man. Right. Six weeks later. Yeah. Uh, so what happened was when I got to the hospital, after a little while, my right hand came back and I could wiggle my toe. I knew I was going to be all right. Everybody else didn't. Um, the, they were sending psychiatrists in. I said, you know, I'm really going to be all right. I really appreciate what you're trying to do, but this is just a process. I'll be with you in a minute. You know, this is all going to be fine. And at two weeks later, there was she was sending her patients to me. You know, at any rate, I started moving around just a little bit. And I had, I asked my friend Greg Leroy to bring me some sticks and shakers and stuff. So he brought me some drumsticks. And, I, you know, the railing on the side of the bed, I was going. So yeah, I still got it. I'm just a hand and a head. But I still got it. I got yeah. it. So, you know. Yeah. So the guy who was uh, the aide in the room, Oscar, I said, Oscar, can you go on my food tray? So he says, yeah, I could do that. So I'm doing. So a little old lady rolls in from the other side of the ward, Edith. She's 80 something. She's had spinal cord injury. I want to play, Eddie, I want to play. I said, okay, Edith, and we had a cowbell. Uh, that, this is when I learned never bring a cowbell to the hospital. <laughs> but we had a cowbell. We put a cowbell. I said, Edith, just play ands one and two. And uh, she couldn't quite get it. Ted, the guy next to me in the bed, I mean, I look like Superman compared to him. He had pancreatic cancer. He had a stroke. He broke every bone in his body and was pinned back together. He had blood clots. And he was death eating the cracker he was just but the strongest most macho guy ever so i can play that part i can do it so oscar i said oscar put you know he says i don't know any guy i said just put the cowbell on his chest and give him a stick he played it perfectly and two and so it had One and two and then three. And yeah. Four. And then Edith was, oh, but Eddie, I still want to play. I said, all right, Edith, just do that. And this is, let me clarify, this isn't a drum circle, it's an ensemble. And it's it's intricate enough that you would never expect these four incapacitated people to even approach it. The yeah. doctors, the nurses were dancing. I thought they were going to throw me out. <laughs> anyway, I started telling all my merchant friends, of which you know I have many, like you. Yes. And I said, I need some bongos and shakers and kibasas and all. Well, they, everybody in the business sent stuff. John Good sent that. One, one morning, they took me in my wheelchair. We said, we got to show you something. They took me down to the day room and John had brought a beautiful drum set. It was in the middle of the, you know, oh, and everybody else was sending. They said, Eddie, please tell your friends to stop. We have nowhere to put this stuff. They still, <laughs> one hour later. Anyway, we moved into the mat room. We had all these people with different disabilities, all the different disciplines, the nurses and, and uh, therapists uh, were using it for range of motion, uh, for uh, focus, memory, attention, uh, balance, everything. We were using these things. And we just started, you know, doing things with all these people. 
and I was making notes. I was in a wheelchair then, mm -hmm. by then. Uh, left side was out, but I had my right foot, my right hand. So I, Greg brought my drums in. We set the drums in, and I could play boom. boom. And it was cool. I could yeah. play a pocket, right? Yeah. And uh, gosh, I mean, uh, the first day I woke up in the rehab, after they shipped me from the ICU, I, I was kind of coming out of the, 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 the anesthesia and everything in the rehab. I woke up and there was Vinnie and Rob and Flynn at the end of my bed. Oh. I know we we're going to talk about this. I, I don't want to interject in the middle of this story, but we were talking about what we feel about people and and, and how I was writing this book and in and, and, and the, the chapter about influences. When we got to Vinny, I said, Vinny's influenced every drummer uh, who ever existed in this time. And I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about his kindness, how kind he is and how he showed up. Yeah. And how deeply emotional and truthful he is about friendship and, and, uh, and the, the love of your friends and family. That's how he's influenced me. You know? Yeah. I mean, other than that, I taught him the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Actually, what, he's been playing with me all these years, and he only plays... The pocket. He says, I love playing with you. I just have to play the pocket and nothing else. I We played last year. and We were doing a, a second line thing. And uh, he was playing exactly what I was playing. You know, I said, wow. He goes, what? I said, play something. <laughs> he played this film, which was like from out of space. Uh, was, what the hell was that? And he went. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted it. No, but I, man, I, yeah. I, but you're so right. And I'm so glad you said that, Eddie, because I think, you know, we all, it's easy to fixate on Vinny's genius as a player. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. out there for the whole world to, to see and to know for going back 40 something years, you can, you can trace back to, to Vinny's incredible legacy as a drummer, but uh, you know, those of us that know him well, and you certainly do, and I and I think I do too. He's just such a an unbelievable human being, friend, loyal to the bone. I mean, he's like, yeah, he's and Robin Flans too, as you said. Robin is just oh, she's she's terrific. She's unbelievable. So anyway, we have this thing going in the hospital, and. And the therapist started taking a real interest in it. Libby Whaley, who was the director uh, at the time, had it approved, and they were starting to use this. As they called it rhythm therapy. And they used it in the hospital. They're still doing it, probably. At any rate, uh, Libby and I showed it to a conference in Northern California. I took uh, Wilfredo Sr. and Carl Par uh, Parazzo with me. <clears throat> These were all therapists. They didn't know who those guys were, and you know, or anything. Yeah. We all played. They played. Uh, <laughs> I played. Tried to stay out of the way, and uh, everybody loved it. Everybody loved it. And this little girl, a therapist, approached me. She said, "Have you ever worked in the field of developmental disabilities?" I said, "No." Uh, I, you know, I obviously am aware of it, but I, you know, she said, "Would you come to Pasadena?" We have classes. There's 26 children with a plethora of diagnoses. I didn't know one from the other. Mm. You know, I said, sure, I'll, I'll come. Pretty much everything I've done since the moment my neck snapped had something to do with trap and the divine guidance. That, that's the way it is. Yeah. I don't, I'm not a preacher. I don't go, I'm not going, I'm just following the bouncing ball yeah. where it leads me. So I, I uh, go to Pasadena, and I bring a couple of drums. That's all I had, some shakers. And we're in a room, and there's like seven kids, and some of them are in wheelchairs. Others are in chairs. We have an egg shaker, and she was saying, okay, take the shaker, put it on the ground, put your hands on your lap. Some of them knew what their lap was. Some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. So this is a learning process. 
Pick up the egg shaker, shake it over your head, put it back on the ground, pick it up, touch your elbow. So there was kinesthetic awareness and, you know, following directions and listening and participating in a group therapy for these kids. Great. It was amazing. Yeah. So next wow. to me, was this kid, Charlie, who had Down syndrome and he was in a wheelchair. And I remember, I remember distinctly the moment I looked down and he looked up at me and smiled uh, and said, oh, thank you, God. I get, I get it. I, I'm, to, I'm all in. That was the moment. I'm all in. And I've never changed. You know, and then along came Dion. Dion was part of that class who's the face of trap all these years. He's in his 40s now. I mean, it's been the most wonderful journey of my life and the lives of those who surround me because it it rubs off. Um, yeah. I have, you know, the videos, uh, even the, yeah. the, hard, the hardest people I know will look at that and think, Eddie, this is really wonderful. It's so moving, you know. And I'm not. Uh, Greg Sutton is a good friend of mine, writer and uh, player. Greg's kind of a New York guy with a, he's got kind of an attitude. That's why we get along so well, right? <laughs> uh, he was talking, he called me up one day and he's not, he's not a mushy kind of guy. And he said, uh, Eddie, I've been watching your videos. I'm really moved. Really? I said, Greg, it's like rubbing shoulders with angels every day. Yeah. He, the writer in him, says, finish those lyrics and call me back. And he hung up. And now we have a new theme song called Rubbing Shoulders with Angels. I'll send it to you. Please, it's, yes. It's really, it's, it's really says it all, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so this, I stayed at that place teaching for six years. I found a place closer to home. I was in Carpinteria at the time I went to Ojai for six years. And I worked with great therapists, and 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 then I, I also volunteered at the hospital twice a week for three years. So I was surrounded by people with that kind of energy and expertise. Even though it wasn't about what I was doing, it was significant in the realm of what we all accomplished together. Yeah. So we're talking about laterality and temporal organization and proprioceptiveness and all these things that I had no idea. I had no idea. We started writing, um, I started writing the, the methodology. I used, I, I used what I knew, I used quarter notes, you know, and, and, you know, things like identifying colors, you know, yeah. Uh, once, they under, uh, once they understood what a uh, quarter note was, and that first time I wrote, people the, who, people who have Down syndrome or other conditions, they, they, they don't necessarily know how to count because sure. they yeah. don't grasp conventional scholastics. So I wrote, in the very beginning, I wrote, uh, I drew <clears throat> a quarter note on the blackboard. I said, who likes rock and roll? Everybody did. Everybody did. It was it, it, it was it warmed my heart to see yeah, that. Yeah. I said, okay. I, I said, here's how I learned how to count. And I said, I said this is a quarter note. It's worth one beat. You know. Then they all did that. Then I got a djembe, and I said, let's play that. And I went one visual. Don't look at the drum as the drum, but the tactile component of the learning curve. You feel it. It's a drum, so you hear it and combine it with speech. It's a multi-sensory approach to learning. Mm -hmm. So then it went from this one quarter note. I said, well, let's play that for me. Oh, one, two, three, four. Then that went, I mean, it gets, there's a hundred pages of really abstract stuff. Accents, colors. Uh, shapes, uh, sign language, you know, and, uh, you know, then they learn right from left, which is really important. Right, left, right, left, right, right, left, left, right, left, 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 right, 
all linear in the beginning. So I used the skills I had as a drummer, but in an entirely different way. It had nothing to do with drumming. You know, wow. and, uh, you know, we didn't do, and there was not a, an, I don't even know how to do a drum circle. Most of us uh, who have been players all our lives don't. I think right. they're great. I've been the drum circles, they're like really powerful. But to compare, now this has been peer study, uh, you know, by PhDs and doctors. It's, uh, it's been published in the journals of special education. So it's, it's not a drum circle or anything. It's really not that, you know. So uh, when people yeah. ask me, can I join your drum circle? I say, yeah, do you have a drum? They say, yeah. I say, okay, ready? Or what's the other one? Yeah, there's two, like two, two drum circle beats. Um, that's how much I know. <laughs> and it's, they're great. They're powerful. They're fun. I encourage all my kids and adults to go. Go down the beach. Don't smoke a joint. Just go down there and play and have fun. You know? It's so beautiful, Eddie. It's it's. Man, I just want to read you what Bob Sudlowski said. Um, oh, Bob? Yeah, Bob's watching. Yeah, our old friend Bob Sudlowski, mm -hmm. and he said, that's precisely why you were saved, Eddie. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree that. with him. I, I, yeah, when I looked at that kid's face, and I say this over and over again, when I look into the eyes of a child with Down syndrome, it's God looking back at me directly Yeah, through this child. So I... I have no doubt about that. I don't mind telling you or anybody else how I feel or where it came from. It is. Absolutely. And Bob, you're right. I felt that. I still know it. I mean, yeah. I had cancer a few years ago. They weren't sure if I would make it. <clears throat> and I had a sat on the end of my bed while we were waiting for the PET scan. And uh, I said to God, as I understand God, I said, Let's go now. I'm ready. Right now, I said, you, I've had 20-something years at the time, 22 years. It's been the best life. Anybody, thank you so much. I'm not sure I'm finished with the assignment yet. Seriously, but I, I, if you want, let's we can go right this minute. I'm ready. And I felt I really meant it. Yeah. And uh, so... Uh, nothing. I, I'm still here. You sure are. The next day, I got a phone call from the hospital. So it looks like uh, it hasn't gone anywhere else in your body. It hasn't metastasized. So you're probably going to be okay. I mean, it's not going to be easy, but we have, uh, you know, we can save you. I said, well, okay. And that, that's not my, that wasn't my choice per se. I was ready to go. And then, yeah. but believe me, I'm glad. I'm very happy to be here for however long I am. And the program's just, you know, it's. I, I have seven new facilities for hundreds of people just these past few weeks. Hundreds of people that were touching their lives every day. Not to mention all the people that are facilitating all over the world now. I can't believe it. We have great programs in Damascus. In Thailand, Spain, South America, all the way to Australia. You know, uh, Incredible. Came up here and learned the program. He, I, I don't know if he's facilitating right now, but I know he uses it in his drum classes. So I never ask anybody to do it exactly, you know, precisely this way or that. Just make it part of your life. Make it part of your curriculum. Mm -hmm. And now I'm teaching people with autism to teach other people with autism the TRAP program. And teaching people with, people with Down syndrome to teach other people with neurodiverse conditions. It's, it's a blessing every day, every single day. So, your, your work is not done, Eddie. Nope. Not, no, I'm going to hang not, around a little bit more. Yeah, good. And, and speaking of Jack Bruno, um, the man of the hour besides yourself. Jack said, love you, Eddie. Making Eddie T making the world a better place. Where did, oh, where, 
Yeah, better than playing drums, better than your meatballs. Well, maybe not meatballs. <laughs> no, he, he, he said, well, maybe not better than, than your meatballs, oh, but it, oh. it's close. <laughs> yesterday, Jack, Jack, you'll like this. The, uh, yesterday, in, the, in your notes or whatever, some, uh, somebody said, you said, Eddie, this, this, and so much more. And the guy said, does so much more mean your recipe for meatballs? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> right? So you don't see what I wrote back because I wrote I wrote back, I would be happy to do that, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> and Facebook blocked me. Oh my God. Oh I my God. Facebook yesterday because <laughs> then they said, you know, do you, I said uh, they gave you uh, some choices to do you, you know and I said, you know, you took this totally out of context. Yeah. And yet they, well, I won't, I won't even get started because they'll, they'll probably shut down this show right now, but the, the amount of shit they let out there. And I've had the same kind of thing happen where I've said something and then I've seen it blocked or, yeah, changed. And it's like, are you this kidding me? It's such a yeah. common thing, especially uh, with Italians, you know? Can yeah. you show me how to do that? Well, I could show you, but then I'd have to kill you. you know? Yeah, exactly. It's a classic. And Anthony Casina is Anthony is the guy that that said it. I remember reading it actually. Anthony Casina, who oh. is saying that was me, Eddie. Um, yeah, okay. So he was a, he was a paisan, like, paisan like us. That, so that's that, what I said. I know they yeah. didn't let him see that yesterday. But <laughs> I replied. Oh man! They blocked me. That was great. Oh fun. man. Well, we're we're about ready to wrap it up. We've uh, the okay. time goes by quick when when you're having fun and laughing for yeah. an hour plus. So um but so for folks watching, um they can find more about this. They can there's a website for trap, right? Or or go to your Yeah, yeah trap learning. One word, traplearning.org. Yeah. That's simple. That's and I'll great. share it on this too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. And, uh, you know, Eddie, I know there's so much more and we'll, and we'll, another time we'll, we'll cover more of all the stuff that you have done and continue to do, but this has been so much fun today. And, and I want to thank you for almost 40 years of being a great friend and, and an inspiration. You've always been an inspiration. And when I saw you, when all that happened 25 years ago, and I, I saw you come back from it, it was just and and you've always been this positive as long as I've known you. And I, I love you, brother. Just I love you too, man. I'm so grateful that you would have me on your show. I, I'm telling you, I watch it and I'm, I get excited to see Jim and Jack and well, everybody that you have on your show. It's it's so to be in that uh, in that on on your team, so to speak, wow. is a, a real honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Okay. All right, Merry Christmas, buddy. Merry and uh, Christmas. yeah, and and uh, hang with me for one second. We'll end the stream. I want to thank everybody for watching. Giant hand for Eddie Taduri, all of our hero inspiration. And uh, stay tuned, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.